Is the prescription drug that you're taking safe? If not, what is the FDA doing about it? Apparently, very little. This is the American Law Journal. The FDA is broken. Those are not the words of some consumer group or trier lawyers association. That's the opinion from an independent medical group study, the future of drug safety, promoting and protecting the health of the public. One of the members of that committee is with us tonight. When you look inside, the news is not very good for the FDA, not very good for the American consumer. Good evening. Welcome to the program. I'm Christopher Naughton. Four guests with me weigh in tonight on the state of the FDA, all with diverse opinions. As you'll find out, Jamie Scheller joins us tonight with Scheller Ludwig & Scheller, one of the largest personal injury firms on the East Coast. A lot of concentration in the area of mass torts and products liability. Al Bixler joins us for the first time from Eckert Siemens, nine or 10 office strong, nine offices strong throughout the Northeast corridor. Al is in the litigation group and he serves his pharmaceutical clients as well as others in this area of litigation. Judge Cohen is with us again tonight and for many years he sat on the uh, Court of Common Pleas bench and heard many complex litigation matters including products liability and mass torts. And Dr. Susan Ellenberg joins us tonight, a former member of the FDA and she is now with the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and was on the committee that assess the future of drug safety, promoting and protecting the health of the public. Quick reminder, folks, that we're here every week. If you need more information once we leave the air, it's easy. Go to our website, AmericanLawJournalTV.com. LawJournalTV.com, every program that we broadcast here on Law Journal later goes up to our website as a webcast. If you have questions, call us 888-78-LAW-TV or write to us. We'd like to hear from you. Write to us at info at LawJournalTV.com. Go to the website and get your law on demand. I'd like to start with Dr. Susan Ellenberg since she has been in the midst of all of this, a member of this committee that has assessed the state of the FDA today. And the, the report as we read it, Dr. Ellenberg, is not simply of an FDA that is weak or ineffective. It's almost a picture of dysfunction. People say that the FDA is broken, is it? No, I don't think the FDA is broken and I don't think that that's what, that's a fair, um, portrayal of what our report said. Um, we found many ways in which the FDA could and, and, and really desperately needs to improve uh, the work that it does, particularly in, uh, in following the safety of, uh, of uh, drug products. But, um, but there are many strengths uh, about the FDA system, and I think those were acknowledged in the report as well. But a, a 25 or so recommendations, uh, some would call that essentially an overhaul. Well, many of the recommendations have to do with improving what the FDA is already doing, providing more resources for the FDA so that they can expand their programs. Well, this report comes out, and it's kind of ironic, it's the 100th anniversary of the Pure Food and Drug Act, 1906, so the FDA is celebrating its 100th year, and in the same year, we find out that this report comes out, again, not very complimentary. Uh, the Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory comes out with an assessment, not very complimentary, and the former chairman of the FDA is indicted. Not, uh, not a very good year, not a very good 100th anniversary, is it? Not as good a year as, uh, as the FDA might have liked it to be, that's certainly true. Uh, but I think um, I'm very optimistic uh, because I think um, while there are many, many wonderful and very hardworking people at the FDA, um, many of them have been struggling because of the, the limited resources that have been made available. Uh, and I think that, um, that the result of these reports and the assessments I think are going to lead to, um, to long needed improvements. The report does have many recommendations, but to, to characterize the agency as broken, I think, really grossly overstates it. So the Washington Post overstepped its bounds. I really think it did. The, the FDA, despite it, despite the, the shortcomings it might have and its lack of resources, I think is acknowledged to be the, the premier agency worldwide in the regulation of pharmaceuticals and, and other materials. And I think it's important to bear that in mind when you read this report with its recommendations. Well, here's a quote from the report, and then we'll get to you, yeah. Jamie. The federal system for approving and regulating drugs is in serious disrepair, and a host of dramatic changes are needed to fix the problem. 
Well, Chris, it's not just a lack of resources. I mean, certainly there's wonderful, brilliant scientists at the FDA, but it's the incestuous relationship between the pharmaceutical companies and these the FDA uh, members and uh, the people that run the FDA that are the main problem that has made it really ineffective. As a plaintiff's lawyer, we've seen for many, many years now, um, before it's come to the public attention, before the IOM report, how this works. We've seen the documents, the correspondence between the FDA and um, the pharmaceutical companies where scientists that are doing good work are pressured to uh, not put forward their concerns, not question drugs, not question the pharmaceutical companies. That combined with the lack of resources and the fact that the FDA people have to rely on these companies, the pharmaceutical companies that are going to make billions of dollars on these products for the science. And the science we've seen in the documents gets twisted and skewed and the FDA has no resources to counter that. And, of course, that's a trial lawyer speaking, but these are the words from Senator Chuck Grassley in Iowa. He says that the lack of introspection and second-guessing is beyond any other agency that he's come in contact with. He's, of course, referring to the FDA and says that it has an all-too-cozy relationship with the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Dr. Ellenberg, again, as a former member of the FDA and, and now uh, as, as part of this committee, isn't that a fair statement that there needs to be greater arm's length between these agencies like the FDA and any corporate uh, magnates, but especially, of course, between itself and the, and the pharmaceutical industry? Well, there certainly, there certainly needs to be arm's length, and there are many, many rules and regulations uh, that people who work for the FDA have to follow uh, precisely to maintain that arm's length uh, relationship. Now, in 1992, um, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act was passed, and that act provided for industry to uh, provide funds every time they submitted a new product uh, to the FDA to help support uh, hiring more reviewers so that the process could move more quickly. Uh, there's, there's two sides of this coin. Um, moving more quickly uh, provides needed products sooner, but people have, have had concerns that things can move too fast, and we don't know enough about safety, and there's certainly uh, on our committee was some concerns about um, the fact that the industry is providing some of the funding for FDA and many people on our committee would have preferred uh, these funds to be provided uh, from, from general revenues. This is a lot of the drugs that you know there's been issues with recently are not drugs that are life-saving or cancer drugs. They're drugs that there are like Vioxx, like Fenfen, like you know, Reslin, where there's other products that have been on the market a long time that are tried and true, that are maybe generic now, or the patents have run out that the companies don't make a lot of money on, and then they rush to get a new and improved product out on the market that they can, you know, push through the FDA. And we see again and again scientists at the FDA that are questioning these drugs. The, the pharmaceutical companies will go to people like Dr. Crawford, the head political person, and those, those criticisms of the in-the-trenches scientists at the FDA will be stamped out. As far as the 1992 funding, that only funds pre-market approval uh, processes. It doesn't fund the post-market. Once a product's on the market, there's no funding to monitor adverse events. In fact, it's just a voluntary system where if a doctor chooses to, they report an adverse event of the patient. And there's statistics that one in, in 10, if that, or some say as much as only one in a hundred get actually reported. So, and Dr. Ellenberg, that's a fair criticism in the sense that I think the FDA uh, probably admits it. Maybe when you, we were there just a few years ago, you realize that there's a lot of time, effort, resources, and money put towards pre-approval, getting it out to the market. But from what I understand, the, the whole notion of s the safety division at the FDA, once it gets out to the market, is seriously underfunded. Again, I think that the recent committee you participated on reached that very conclusion. That, that's, that's right. Um, there are um, many more things that the post-marketing people could do if they had access to more resources. They could, uh, they could uh, purchase access, for example, to large databases, uh, which would allow them to do a better job of, of, um, of studying drugs once they were on the market. And uh, those, those kinds of things are expensive. But um, it, it's, it needs to be recognized that, the, that it's not just the people in the post-marketing group who are looking at safety. Um, the, the, uh, the, user fee, uh, the user fees did limit um, the, the funding to pre-market safety for the first couple of rounds. But since 
Uh, I think the last, uh, the last user fee passed in 2002. Some funds are now allowed for, uh, for post-marketing safety, but it's still not enough. Well, let, still me, let me comment about this because it seems sometimes that we talk about a broken agency, it's really our expectations of what an agency can do, especially in the federal government, uh, it might be too high. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the vast majority of drugs approved by the FDA have come down to the consumer use and have been relatively effective and relatively safe. So when we're talking about the, a, a few drugs that have gotten all highlights and, and uh, caused all sorts of trials and publicity, uh, we're really not talking about the vast majority of prescriptions in this country. As a matter of fact, Judge, I think it's only 3% of the drugs that have been admitted to the, um, to the market but that have been admitted into the marketplace over the last 20 years have been pulled. But we're talking about drugs that have made billions of dollars for pharmaceutical companies. We're talking about drugs that have hurt hundreds of thousands of people. So, well, it's 3%, but it's a drug like Vioxx that was so widely prescribed to, to such huge volumes of people because it was for, you know, for any kind of ache or pain it was given to people. So it, 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 it is important. And you know, there shouldn't be a carte blanche to getting drugs approved. Uh, there's a lot of databases that keep track of um, post-marketing adverse events like, you know, private, like the Veterans Association, the Kaiser Permanente. The FDA doesn't even access things as simple as that. Well, the FDA, to, actually, the FDA does access those databases, well, they, but they need, they need more funds to access uh, to access them better and and they need they need better tools that's it's certainly very true. limited and it's just a recent development I mean it's something that could have been done years ago and the pre-market studies are, are very limited and very controlled by the pharmaceutical companies because the FDA doesn't people don't know that the FDA doesn't do their own studies on these drugs they rely on the on the studies done by the pharmaceutical companies and the pharmaceutical companies in many of the cases that I've worked on have skewed the results have pressured scientists to change the data and then they present this data in a skewed way to the FDA and it's and the FDA has no resources to know if what's being presented to them is true and accurate well I, I you know that's 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 really not the case the the FDA has people has inspectors who go out to, uh, to pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I have been involved with, uh, when I was at the FDA, I was involved with uh, assessing products where the inspectors went out and they found, uh, they found records that indicated that things were not exactly as the pharmaceutical company had said that they were. That information got involved in the, uh, got included in the presentation to advisory committee and it bore on the, uh, it bore on the ultimate, uh, ultimate approval or non-approval decisions. Um, I, I, I really, um, it's just not right to characterize the FDA as sort of hopeless pawns of the pharmaceutical industry. Even your committee said that the process needs to be a little bit more transparent, correct? The process, uh, well, transparency is always a good. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly where in the report um, it was well, said Jamie that. was just talking about, you know, some of these reports that appear on websites, in other words, uh, clinical trials, that sort of thing, post-market statistics, and you're involved in, in statistics and have been for some time. Shouldn't the public get a hold of some of these statistics? Uh, what I understand is that some uh, pharmaceutical companies, and maybe Al Bixler will, will uh, enlighten me uh, as to this, don't want to have some of these studies divulged because of trade yes, secrets. Yes, this is, this, is, this, is this is a big concern, not just of our committee, but it's been a concern for a number of years that, that uh, studies can be performed and nobody ever hears about them. They get, they get, uh, they get hidden away and there is a movement now, uh, in fact a requirement, I think it was a part of the, the Food and Drug Administration Modernization Act of 1997 that, um, that all clinical trials need to get registered. Uh, so that people can know what studies were actually done and, uh, and that there needs to be some public description of the, of the results. That's the transparency we're talking that's about. A, right. That's a trans that that's true. And, and we should understand that clinical trials are, uh, pre-marketing pre clinical trials are done by the drug companies because no one else is going to do them. The federal government's not going to fund them. There's not enough money to fund them. And the pharmaceutical companies have to do it in order to get their drugs approved. They do clinical trials as part of their new drug submissions and new drug submissions are often rejected by the FDA. They're rejected regularly by the FDA, and the FDA regularly rejects companies seeking to expand the indication for their drug. So it is not as if you submit it and the FDA rubber stamps it and you get your approvals. I, That's I would, not the way. Right? I, I would the also market surveillance recommendation that was given in this report is probably a good idea 
although I think the plaintiff's trial lawyers have pretty much taken over the post-market surveillance of most drugs, and that the fear of lawsuits is motivating many of the uh, drug companies who aren't really monsters, by the way, but motivated by the financial gain or financial loss to look more carefully at their product after it reaches the market. And, and Chris, it shouldn't be the job of plaintiff's lawyers to do purse marketing surveillance on, on drugs. It's, that's the job of the FDA. And we can continue to sit here and say, it's the plaintiff's lawyers. They're picking on the FDA. They're picking on the pharmaceutical companies. But the fact of the matter is it's the IOM, an independent committee commissioned by the FDA, that looked at the FDA and came up with these determinations that the FDA is in serious trouble and needs serious changes. It's not the plaintiff's lawyers. It's not people bringing lawsuits. It's their own independent commission. And we, have to, we can't use the plaintiff's lawyers as an excuse to sweep this under the carpet. And I don't think, I don't think anyone on the panel is. No one is saying that. What we're saying here is that there's got to be safety to the public. And who else is going to assure the safety well, maybe ultimately after judge, the FDA? Um, ultimately, <laughs> Judge, you're right. I think maybe what uh, Ms. Scheller is saying is it should not just fall into the laps of trial lawyers and the plaintiff's bar. They've been undercut a little bit uh, somewhat over the last few years with tort reform. And correct me if I'm wrong, Judge, help me out here. Wasn't there a class, and Al, all of you can help me out here, the Class Action Fairness Act this year, isn't there a movement within the law to allow pharmaceutical companies to depend more and more on FDA approval? And if F the FDA says yes, I know it's not, it hasn't been an airtight defense. If that case came before you, Judge, just because the FDA approve, approves it doesn't provide an airtight defense for the pharmaceutical no, companies. It, it, but I, I understand with this new law, it's moving in that direction. Am I wrong? Well, no. I think that the class action fairness issue is really just moving the uh, cases, a class action where the amount of money is more than $5 million into the federal system, where the administration thought that the pharmaceutical companies would get a better shake in the federal courts than they do in the state court. All right. I, I thought it had no, something to do with, the, with more responsibility yeah. on the shoulders of the FDA. It's federal, right or wrong? federal preemption. And mm, it's, it. there's a lot of things now. There has been for many years, and, and certainly the pendulum is swinging in the way of more conservative activist judge that make it more and more difficult every day for plaintiffs, lawyers, or injured people to bring their claims. Federal preemption, the, the theory is, is that if the product was reviewed by the FDA and approved, you essentially can't bring a case for, uh, against the pharmaceutical company. But what we know as plaintiff's lawyers is, is you know, what, what the IOM themselves found is the Institute FDA, of Medicine. the Institute of Medicine found, is that approval by the FDA because of their limited resources and the influences of the pharmaceutical company is not an exhaustive uh, or, or, you know, uh, shield for the public. And so, to make that leap that if the FDA reviewed it, then the pharmaceutical didn't, company did everything right is a big leap. The drug companies are faced with claims in which the allegation is made these companies didn't adequately warn of the dangers of the drug. Warning labels are expressly approved by the FDA. And to say that a state court somewhere can say, you know, this label, which was approved by the federal government, which under our Constitution is the supreme law of the land, is not adequate because we, a trial court judge in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or an appellate court judge in those states, says differently, uh, is just inconsistent with our federal system. And the FDA, I think, has recognized this well, do you recently. Think, do, you, do you think it would be fair, Al, maybe you do, that uh, once an FDA approves a drug, it should provide cover for your clients for pharmaceutical companies? Especially well, when in, the in Independent Commission finds 25 things plus that are that are pro severely problematic and need to be corrected. I mean, that was Let their me get own in terms of in terms of in terms of labeling. Yes, when the FDA approves a drug label, okay. but not beyond. You're not saying beyond labeling. I'm talking about labeling okay. specifically. When right. the FDA approves a drug label and says this is what has to be in the label, and the regulations say what types of studies that you can cite, what you can and can't say in labels, and the FDA has to approve every word of it. When they approve it, a state court should not be able to say, but. You should have added this language, too. But, Al, suppose the state court finds or the, the plaintiff's side is able to produce f facts which would indicate that the FDA was misled in the labeling. Uh, then they're not preempted and they're not immunized by the FDA labeling law. And I, and I think that most courts would recognize that. 
Well, here's a quote from the study, also quoted in the Washington Post. Drugs are approved on both the benefit and the risk, and if the agency becomes too risk adverse, it runs the risk of not approving important new drugs that could benefit patients. So that runs contrary to some of the things that we're talking about, about getting drugs out too quickly. The other side, and again, we have to look at the risk and benefit analysis, might be we don't get a drug to market soon enough. Well, it is, it's a, it, it is a balance that has to be made, and, and of course, different people might have different views about where, uh, about how that balance should be, uh, should, should, should be, should be done. Um, though anybody who thinks that they have been um, harmed by a drug where the safety information was not as well known as they might have liked it to be would wish that we had taken a little, the FDA had taken a little bit longer. Those people who are desperately waiting for new medications because the existing medications are not helping them uh, would like to get those out sooner. I think we're leaving out an important component of this process which is the doctors, your doctors, who prescribe the medications to you. My wife is a physician and she has patients who swore that the only uh, medication that helped them in their chronic arthritis, which was debilitating, re re you know, destroyed their quality of life, were COX-2 inhibitors. And these drugs such are now... Such as Vioxx. Such as Vioxx, Bextra, Celebrex. Right. These drugs are very difficult to prescribe now, if at all, because of the risk of liability. And these patients, as a result, simply are not living the quality of life that they were before. And they would be willing to take the small excess risk of a heart attack to obtain that same quality of life they had before. And doctors are the people who prescribe these medications. Any discussion about whether a, a drug is correct for a patient has to involve a dialogue between the patient and the doctor. That's why we have the learned intermediary rule, which simply recognizes that the pharmaceutical manufacturers owe a duty to provide information to the prescriber, the doctors involved, not directly necessarily to the consumers, but to the doctors who make the prescribing decisions so that that doctor can make a decision based upon an assessment of the condition of his or her patient, the risks and the benefits of the particular drug. That raises the other issue, uh, Al, dealing with the learned intermediary. Uh, if there are risks, if there are, and by the way, just as a, a sidelight, some statistic now that it seems that over 75% of patient visits to physicians results in a prescription and the physician himself or herself is not sufficiently proactive in following up to make sure that the side effects or the problems or the hazards involved in a drug uh, are avoided. Uh, and uh, it becomes a problem now in medical malpractice. They're not following up and they're not looking for the symptoms of drug interaction and adverse drug reactions. And clearly they should be doing that. Uh, with all of their patients, and in an ideal world they would be, but uh, you know sometimes we don't live in an ideal world. Pa physicians are pressured these days particularly to uh, process patients through their office very quickly and perhaps don't spend the time communicating that they should. But that doesn't mean that the FDA system is broken. It means that there's another piece of the process which needs work. But it's, it's not fair to the patient or the doctor, like in the case of Vioxx, to have the pharmaceutical company misstate the extent of the risk. And that's why Vioxx was pulled off the market, because it was found out that instead of one out of 10,000 patients got a heart attack, way more than that got a heart attack. And this was withheld from the public, and this was withheld from the physicians. It, there's no question that a patient, if they're racked with arthritis, you know, and they get, they get ulcers from the traditional drugs, should have that opportunity to say, gosh, one in 10 people get heart attacks, but my life is so miserable, I'm going to take the risk of a heart attack so I can get some relief, and this is the only drug that works for me. But it's not fair to another patient who might not want to take that risk, who might have a milder case or might have just twisted their back, you know, playing sports with their kids, and, and could take a traditional uh, yeah, drug that well, doesn't have the risks and well, it's about the, being honest with the public it's about having accurate information so patients and physicians can fairly make these determinations well what what the report is all about is doing a better job giving the FDA the tools to do a better job to get that information quickly it, it is uh, pro it is surely unavoidable that for when a product first goes out on the market that there will be that there may be unknown risks if we insisted that we knew absolutely everything about uh, about a product before it went on the market we wouldn't have any drugs at all uh, so some judgment has to be made that uh, and 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 actually an enormous amount of information is collected 
uh, for most of the drugs that go out there, particularly for drugs that are uh, that are intended for, for, for large populations. These studies are, are substantial and, and very often there's, uh, there's additional post-marketing studies done, but even with all of that, you don't know everything that there is to know and we need to have better post-marketing systems so that the, the fact that something is found out later doesn't mean that the product shouldn't have been approved or that something was wrong or that somebody was hiding something. There are things that we just are not gonna know until products get used in a wider population uh, for a longer period of time. You know, there are free pointers that uh, both the Institute of Medicine uh, that uh, Susan Ellenberg participated on and also the Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee uh, came up with some suggestions. I think that uh, obviously I think maybe all four of my guests tonight would agree on. One is that the experts would ban consumer advertising of newly improved classes of drugs until they have been on the market long enough for any problems to emerge. Secondly, give the FDA new powers to find drug makers that fail to complete required safety studies, and three, to take steps to limit conflicts of interest and broaden the range of expertise on panels appointed by the agency to review scientific data on proposed drugs. We can get uh, four amens on the set here tonight, can't we? I think I, I would certainly agree with it, except I have one problem with the advertising. I, I think maybe we ought to ban prescription advertising really, altogether. Really, Judge? judge. That's a strong statement. Uh, that that that's, uh, doesn't sound like it's coming out of a judge who so strongly supports the First Amendment. Well, it's not so much the first, well, that's what they're going to claim the First Amendment, but the issue of prescri prescribing drugs and the idea of a patient going to a physician uh, and telling or demanding that the physician give him or her the drug that was on television is an anathema to me. One last question here for the group. Uh, quick answers all the way around. Again, we try not to, to get into the partisan aspect of this, but it's the white elephant in the room, so let me pose it. We'll start with uh, Jamie Scheller. Democrats have just taken over uh, Congress, the House and the Senate. One would suspect there would probably be greater oversight of some of these agencies anyway. What impact do you think it might have, if any? I think it's going to be a tough battle. One thing the public has to understand is that these drugs, a Vioxx alone, makes hundreds of millions of dollars a year. If there's a problem with it post-marketing where there's risks and the company has to pull it, not only do they lose the hundreds of millions of dollars a year for the drug, their stocks go down. The impact is huge. They're, when their stock goes down, like it did with Vioxx when it was pulled from the market and many other drugs, you're talking about huge money and the public has to realize that that's what what's at stake here it's huge amounts of money and it's going to be a tough battle all around even with the democratic house and senate any other commentary regarding that al well i think you're going to be looking at a, a change in the, the both houses of congress and it's very very likely i would suspect that you'll see greater hearings and oversight uh... from various house committees on the fda and, and people uh, who've expressed a lot of interest in it over the years and haven't been in the majority uh... dr ellenberg um, well, um, uh, just I, a guess on your part. We're just opining yeah, here. Um, John Dingell was very, very tough on the FDA uh, back when uh, the Democrats were in the majority, and he was the chairman of the committee. And I understand he's going to be the chairman of the committee again. So I expect that we'll we'll, we'll see him in action again. And Judge, we know you're never partisan or political, but what of it? Well, I, I picture here Godzilla versus the uh, the gorilla in there of these <laughs> giants fighting in front of Congress. One sinking as much immunity from lawsuits as they possibly can, and the other uh, looking at them as if they're mo the monster themselves. So I, let's look. We'll see some action in this particular Congress this year. Godzilla versus King Kong Part Two. That's right. I want to thank my guests for joining us tonight. Uh, riveting conversation. Jamie Scheller representing the plaintiffs. Al Bixler representing uh, the corporate counsel in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, uh, Judge Gene Cohen uh, stepping up to the plate, as he often does here on the program, and Dr. Uh, Susan Ellenberg with the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Folks, we want to remind you that every program that we broadcast here on the American Law Journal later goes up to our website as a webcast. You can watch any program that we've broadcast here in the last 12 months. If you need more information, call us toll-free, 888-78-LAW-TV. Write to us at info at lawjournaltv.com. Go to the website and get your law on the man. I'm attorney Christopher Norton. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week right here on the American Law Journal. Good night now. Tonight's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Scheller, Ludwig, and Scheller. 
one of the largest personal injury firms on the East Coast, winning large verdicts for their clients injured by Vioxx and other dangerous medicine, defective medical devices, consumer protection class action lawsuits, and product liability. Scheller, Ludwig, and Scheller. 800-883-2299 and at Scheller.com.